Oh, there. Hello. hello. Hi. Hi, I'm here. I didn't know. Good morning. Oh, hello. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? All right. I've received your email, so I'll answer you soon. Uh, uh, in the meantime, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, so, but I'm uh, Ida. And I'm doing my BTEC in Aerospace Engineering from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Madras. And I'm in my fourth semester right now and looking for internship. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. respond to your email. Like I said, I have, um, you know, we have our, our Summer of Code projects and we have other opportunities as well. So, welcome. Everyone, turn on your camera. <laughs> How's everyone today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you get anywhere with that code? I'm still working on it. Um, I didn't have a lot of time over the weekend, but I'll, I'll work on it. Okay. So you want me to go over what you got or not? Uh, not yet. I'm still, <laughs> I don't have it up and ready. So. Um, okay, no, good. But I mean, I understand the problem anyways. Like, I understand how it'd be implemented. And I did get the code from uh, Krishna, so. You did? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The code I sent you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's older code. Okay. From December 31st. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the Rappaport um, reminder or. or oh, uh, yeah. The it led me into a whole bunch of cell biology. So, oh, good. Um, okay. You're uh, sort of a pioneer in that. Yeah. And sticking sticking needles into. Uh, do you know about Rappaport's work, Bradley? No. You know, Rappaport uh, stuck two needles into cells and then watched them go under undergo cell division. And the, the needles were very fine, so they were bent from the forces. And he could measure the forces then of cell division. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He was a pioneer in this thing. What, what, what are the papers go back to the 60s or so? Um, yeah, quite early. Yeah, yeah. by the way, uh, axolotl, early axolotl cells are big enough to do the same experiments. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're but, tedious, <laughs> but not impossible. <laughs> okay. I'm, um, anyway, I'm putting a bunch of things together in a PowerPoint. And I don't know uh, if uh, anybody in engineering is interested in the cell biology, but I was putting it together to kind of prove Ingber's point where the, um, Cytoskeleton is connected to the um, connect nodes on the kind of the corners of the cells and to oh, the cytoskeleton. I see. And okay. there's numerous articles about that. And I'm still looking for a, a um, stress strain curve or even a force distance curve. In um, one case, they did a, it as a ratio. And I plotted it against something else. It threw away. It, it threw away. Like, <laughs> they have no like. Never, none of them have talked to a mechanical engineer in their lifetime. I don't know. Probably a plumber. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm having a bad time finding any stress strain curves. Okay. Did you do any uh, follow up? Um, from Rappaport's papers? Yeah, I uh, just put them into a search engine and I've gotten a whole bunch of things out of it. Um, oh, okay, because you, you can do forward searches with Web of Science and uh, with Google Scholar. Oh, with Google Scholar as well. Okay, well, yeah. when yeah. they come up, you, you'll sometimes you'll get them and they'll have um, the citations and the papers yeah. that are re re relevant and it'll take you to scopes sometimes uh, in my and I, web of science shows quite a bit 
Google Scholar shows too much. <laughs> and, the, and Google Scholar is inconvenient, but it's hard to download more than one citation at a time. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, um, I, I like Web of Science, but I haven't been able to find it like I did before on the university's website. Oh, I have the website. Uh, give me a second. I'll use the other computer center to you. Okay. Uh, all right, because okay. that works the best. Yeah. Or at least in, it has in the past. Anyway, I've got this whole raft of papers, and you can't see them. I went and hid them behind me, but yeah. <laughs> um, I print out the ones that are I feel are important, and then I go through them, and usually only a tenth of them are the ones that I want, but I've got got a nice PowerPoint coming. Oh, good. <laughs> so, so, oh, maybe, so find a skeleton and yeah, maybe present it to us then. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? <laughs> present it to us. Yeah. When you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, I, sh I should because I don't think the two engineers and my um, my um, supervisors go. Yeah, yeah. This is like cell biology. Yeah, it's attached. <laughs> Show us the tensegrity. And I'm going, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only work on it about two hours at a time before it gives me frizzle brain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, uh, anyway. Yeah, look forward to the PowerPoint on uh, this. Yeah, I'll just give you the, the stuff on the cell biology because that's, well, I'm, uh, I'm, got a note back from Comsol telling me how I could put basically in quote sensors into my model and pre-stress without having to actually elongate the structure. So oh. Oh. so I I mean that's what I get to do this week. But, um yeah. Yeah. Yeah we were we were working on uh, designs for intracellular uh uh, stress measurements. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I want to know those too. Okay, so <laughs> we never made one, but <laughs> designed it. Yeah, I have an itch to show you the PowerPoint that I'm making, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's lots of other things. Um, Ira wants um is it Ira? Yeah. Yeah. Ira. 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 Yeah. She probably wants to discuss um the summer is it summer of code or yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh you haven't touched I got on two minutes late. Okay. Oh so I didn't miss that. Well we didn't talk well uh, she introduced herself but I didn't really go through uh the project. Oh, okay. Why don't you do that? Because uh Ira is, uh, as I understand it, into astronautics. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure she's going to be very interested in the rest of the stuff today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. yeah, this is for like Ira and maybe some of the other people who are interested in uh, the right. project. We're starting to get people in the Slack who are. Ira, are you there? <laughs> oh, yes, sir, definitely. Well, okay. How about turning on your camera so we can see what you look like? <laughs> Uh, she was actually the network connection was poor, so that class turned it off. Okay. Yeah. You can turn it on for a moment, turn it off. Then. <laughs> um, <laughs> there she Good morning. Good morning. See, she exists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, you can turn it off now if you want. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, this is for like, I, I see we have people coming into the Slack who are interested in your Sush Month. Uh, interested in the project and um, so I'll, I'll go over it a little bit. Uh, so we've been doing this work on graph neural networks which are neural networks that um, you take data from the real world and it forms some sort of graph which is a connected uh, set of nodes or features and then you take that data and you put it into a neural network. And that neural network produces a uh, uh, an embedding or some sort of representation of the data. And then from that, you can build network 
uh, representations of the data that comes in. So it's like a neural network. It's, uh, you know, and it discovers patterns, it discovers other types of things, but you're keeping that network structure. And they've used this for a lot of different applications in medicine, in uh, molecular biology, in uh, engineering, and other domains. So the project that we did last year was uh, something called Devograph, which was where we took microscopy data, which are, you know, images of a, in this case, it was an embryo. It could be any microscopy, set of microscopy images. Uh, we identified the nodes of the net, of the graphs in the, in the data. And then we were able to uh, extract that structure from the, uh, from the data because there's, you know, there's a structure in the data that forms a, a graph, but that structure isn't inherent. It's not just a graph. It's embedded in some background and, and other things. So we want to find the features that form this graph and then pull it out from many different sources or many different sets of images and then uh, find this graph that we can then uh, identify. Well, actually, it generates a bunch of potential graphs and we can identify the ones that are the most informative. So that's what you do with the neural network part. And then we can use those graphs for other things. We can use them for, well, we talk about in the group, uh, embryo networks, we talk about tensegrity networks, we talk about other types of graphs and, and representations of the embryo. So it actually is quite useful. But the key is is to get that, that pipeline from the images and image processing to the neural network input and then the neural network output. That's the project. And so uh, I'll be making the project public uh, soon um and i'll be putting so i don't know ira if you're in our slack but i can send you uh, uh in the email i'll send you later i'll send you a link to join that and then i know sushmanth is in the slack already so you can get uh access to that and that's where we'll be posting a lot of the information about this project um and so last year we did a project we, we developed a pipeline uh going from image processing to the uh, representations. And then another thing you do with representations is create, uh, you know, you can move towards things like topological data analysis, where you actually try to identify things like uh, simplexes, which are sets of shapes in a, in a graph. And those are useful because it tells you something about the geometry of your problem. And uh, that, that's in interesting in a number of ways. So we developed, last year we developed a pipeline that involved all of that. And it's at varying stages of uh, completion, I guess. I mean, we have like sort of proof of concept for each uh, part of that pipeline, but we're trying to refine it this year. We're trying to get um, things a little bit more developed. The image processing part, the input data part, is pretty much in good shape because we've also plugged that into our uh, Devo Learn package, which is a, uh, another... Uh, image processing, deep learning package. So that's that's pretty much done. Although you may need to, and I see that there, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that there's some issues and in, in, um, pull requests involving that. But, um, but that should be pretty much in place. The part that we want people to focus on this year is in developing the neural network, the graph embeddings part, and then to maybe something like topological data analysis. And you don't have to be an expert in those areas. Uh, you just have to be able to work with uh, data and you have to be able to work with code and, and figure out how to do things. Um, most of our students are usually undergrads um, and they, they, you know, they can, it, it teaches you how to work with these sorts of problems and develop solutions for them. And so, you know, I know, I know if you're familiar with the Summer of Code program, you know, it, it gives you funding for like an, a summer, or I think they're a little bit more flexible now. Um, and it allows you to, you know, learn how to do that. So you, you start to work on the uh, existing code. You'll go through it. You'll understand what that is. Usually that's before people are selected to work on it, but you get a handle of what's there. And then you can go from there and you can say, okay, I want to, you write a proposal and you say, okay, I want to do these things this summer. And, uh, 
and then we'll you know we'll work on it maybe if people get selected we'll work on the uh, project and we'll get uh, make some progress so that's that's pretty much it let me share my screen because I have our github repository here um, share my entire screen okay uh, so this is the Devo Learn repository. Uh, this is GitHub.com Devo Learn, and this is where we have our a lot of the stuff that we've been doing with image processing and deep learning, and those sorts of things. So this is the Devo Learn repository. We have the Devo Learn software, which is a, a pre-trained model uh, that is based on deep learning neural net, you know, neural networks. Really? Uh, well, yeah. How about put, how about putting URLs into the chat? Yeah, let me see if I can put this in the chat. All right. So that's the, the GitHub repository, or the GitHub organization. Um, so this is DevoLearn. This has a lot of the uh, pre-trained deep learning model. Uh, you know, we have a release of this but it's uh, kind of out of date with what's in the repository. So the repository is a place to go for like the latest. And there's a, there's a readme in here and it tells you how to go through uh, the software and install it and work with it. Really in the case of this, for the purposes of this project, you really need to understand the code. So the code is in like Devo Learn, this, uh, repo this, this directory in this repository. And, you know, there are these different, uh, components to the uh, so core software. So this is what's used to extract uh, data from images. So you're extracting features from images using this code. Uh, there's some training images in here as well. And we have some training data sets that we use typically for these things. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I mean, I can give you training data sets, but I think we actually have them in the documentation for these two different projects. So this is Devo Learn. We have a paper actually that summarizes things a little bit better than the README. Um, and it kind of walks through some of the things that, you know, when you start to use the software, you install it, then you can do things with different images. There are these different data sources here you can work with. And basically you create, you take an input, you create a segmentation map which is taking the features off of an image that the image is noise. So you can uh, mask the image with noise and still get a pretty good, um, you know, pretty good set of features. Uh, and, you know, it puts it into a, a spatial reference frame in this two dimensional example. And then you're going to be using these images then in the second step to extract graph structure out of these Dots. So it's going to give you a bunch of dots, which are like cell centroids. I think you can also extract um, some membrane edges and things like that, uh, depending on how, you, if you play with the threshold and you uh, play with the model a little bit, you can do things like that as well. And then that gives you uh, a basis for these graph representations. So this is just the, the, the sort of the first step in this pipeline using DevoLearn to extract images um extract data from images and then there's this there there are a couple other directories in here data science demos which we've been doing uh demos for data science if you're interested in that and uh devo learn web which is another set of models that we have so this is another set of machine learning models that we've worked on in the past uh that's available through web app that might be also useful to people if they're uh, interested in using an alternate uh, model for that first step. But DevoGraph is this software that we developed last year in the summer of code. And this has uh, you know, a, a pipeline associated with it. So there are a number of steps here uh, that you go through. You extract the data, you extract a set of features, you find, you use a neural network to find the graph structure, and then you pass that graph structure to an embedding, which you can then, you know, uh, select the best embedding, or you can uh, use that for further analysis of data. So DevoGraph is, we have a, repos or a repository DevoGraph. We have a directory DevoGraph. And this is where we have a lot of the stuff from last year. We have 
different data sets, uh, different models. Um, this was actually based on refactoring an existing uh, graph neural network model. So this is something that um, is, uh, you know, it's it's already, it was known to work, but it was uh, refactored for this purpose. And so we're not quite, you know, in the same position we are with DevoLearn, with DevoGraph, but it's, it's coming along. And so the point here would be, you would be working on this DevoGraph uh, uh, project. You'd be working on the latter parts of this pipeline and, uh, you know, we'll see how far people get because <laughs> that's the point is to learn things, but also to, to actually create something and advance what we have. So that's, uh, that's a summary. I can get a summary to you uh, pretty soon. I've, I've gotten it written up. Uh, I just haven't posted it publicly yet. Uh, really? but, yeah. How about the financial aspect? How much does this student get per cent? Uh, it's, it's several thousand dollars, uh, but I don't know what the current uh, amount is. But it's, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. So it's pretty, it's pretty generous for like maybe a, a couple of months. Uh, they, you know, they, they pay, um, you know, they, they, I think it's pretty, it's considered to be pretty uh, competitive. So compared to like if you were to get an internship or something. So th yeah, there is a selection process, but I mean, you know, that's something that we'll talk about as we get closer. Actually, once the project's announced. Because you have to go through a couple of steps. We have to get the project announced, and then we have to uh, get people to apply, and then we have to see how many spots we get and so forth. So it's a process that uh, usually we don't get that many spots. I'll just tell people right now. But, you know, that's something that we usually, uh, every year we go through uh, the, uh, the uh, application process. So you write a proposal, and then a subset of people get selected for that. And if you work on the proposal and don't get selected, I mean, you know, you can still work on it, uh, different versions of it over the summer, or you can use that for something else. You know, it's not a waste of time, as they say, because you gain some experience with, with open source and with um, working with these kind of technologies. Now- So um, when does oh. the collection set start? Uh, pretty soon, uh, probably we start in earnest in like March. So I think the deadline is in to submit it is like in April or May. And the timeline. April 20th. What is that? April 20th. April 20th. Uh, the deadline is in April 20th. Uh, okay. And it was, yeah, it was starting at March 22, I think. And okay. application for the organization so was like in February 7th will be the last day for applying for organizations. Yeah. yeah. Brad, Bradley's been doing this for a number of years. So Bradley, can you estimate how many successful applications you've had and uh, how many students? Well, I mean, it just depends on the year because they have like a, some years it's very, uh, very limited. And some years, like last year, we got everyone we requested, which was kind of weird. Oh. <laughs> but not that's not typical. So How, how many years you've been doing this? Uh, probably about six. Maybe, yeah. So it's yeah. like 2017, many, I think. How many students uh, got into it over over that whole time? Yeah. Oh, probably from Diva Worm about uh, maybe 12. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, I, I just want to point out he's been very successful in this program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I, I I'm very good at like helping people with these sorts of things, and uh, I wish I had them when I had to write grants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's another person who, well, the person who headed up this last year, Jia Hong Lee, he was a person who created the pipeline for this. Uh, we had two students. One student worked on a lot of the data uh, wrangling and and working on getting. Uh, refining uh, DevoLearn for this purpose, and then Jia Hong worked on some uh, getting the model, the graph neural network model, the refactor, and the pipeline. And he's going to be doing. He expressed interest in being a co-mentor this year, 
So if you you know if you're in the Slack, you can ask him. You know you can like look up Jia Hong Lee in the Slack, and he you know you can message him if you have questions as well, because he's actually done a lot of the groundwork for this. So if it's some really technical question, he'll be able to answer it. Like you know whatever they did last year, um, you know there's a lot of technical stuff um, that he is. I guess intimately familiar with. I don't know how much you'll remember, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. And you know, another thing too is that we have a lot of documentation that gets out of date and and things like that. So that's another thing that um, we'll be trying to work on as well. So it's just like telling people what to how to install things and what the latest uh, version of things to use and, and that so forth. Um, so that that's another thing that is always part of that project is, is the documentation. So, Professor, is there any website from where the application has to be filled? Uh, well, that all that information will come is they because uh, the program gets like every year it changes, and they have they have a portal, but we'll you know we'll uh, I'll, I'll make that material available to people as that as we get closer because they change things from year to year but yeah there's like a portal that you apply through and uh but that's that's part of the announcement uh, so Schmidt and ira just as a way of explanation the reason i'm bobbing up and down is i'm walking on a treadmill with a desk on it and holds my computer <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's winter here and it's cold outside. This is the one way to get exercise here. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was trying to contact Jian Li for one week. I couldn't get his mail ID or something like that. Uh, actually, read the whole report of Devograph. I understood the pipeline. I want to discuss further. That's the reason I was um, searching. Uh, and I contributed to Devolan also. There are some issues in Devolan. The most of the packages in, uh, installed in requirement.txt are outdated actually. Yeah. And uh, whatever GitHub workflow was going through, it was going through like it was searching in Python 3.8 and 3.7 version. Those are need to update it to 3.10.9 maybe. And the, I don't know, like whatever the tests I am running in my local computer, they are passing out. But when I am trying to run on GitHub workflow, every time they are getting like they are not passing the test and then i found out that those tests should uh, that would, uh, in github workflow the version of python should be changed to 3.10.9 actually i was since waiting to merge that one i tried to contact my deb also um he was busy with some paper research paper so he told like he will see within a two days uh, yeah. And uh, can, can you just share any contact of jiang uh, i could talk with him and discuss it further please uh, yeah, yeah, I'll send that to you in the Slack. Um, but yeah, usually, yeah, I think, you know, he has an email, but I think it's like, uh, I'll share it with you okay. in the Slack. So yeah, that brings me to the, uh, okay. yeah, so the DevoLearn repository. Actually, like, can you create any separate group for DevoGraph? I mean, the DevoLearn has separate group like that. We can create a separate DevoLearn and have me and Jiang Li, et cetera, to that, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we. Yeah, I can. I can create a separate. So you're talking about a separate Slack channel. For yeah, Devograph. for yeah. Uh, Devo, uh, Devo Graph, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, so this is the DevoLearn uh, repository, and we've had a number of pull requests and issues that have been created. So the pull requests, we have a couple here outstanding. From last uh, summer, I'm not really sure why these are still open, but we'll get these uh, sorted out. Uh, and then this one here, which is Sushmanth, adding requirements in file for generating requirements text uh, for better dependency management. So that'll be um, so that needs to be accepted. I want to make sure that um, uh, so uh, uh, Minoc and Mayuk have been doing some. Uh, they've yeah. been doing the maintaining on the repository, and I want to make sure that they get to take a look at this. So 
This is, yeah, we can suggest uh, Mayok and Minoc mm -hmm. as reviewers on that. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. I, I think probably Mayok would be. Uh, maybe mine. Actually, they were two were busy, Bradley. I have talked with him because uh, Mayuk was publishing some interpenetrality of neural networks, some paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told like he will see within a week. Uh, so yeah. I thought of not disturbing him. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's uh, a lot of times, you know, that'll happen in maintaining, uh, you know, we have to wait a while. But that's when they get to it, they'll, they'll be able to do it. Okay. So that's good. Thank you. Congratulations for that uh, pull request. We'll see if it gets accepted as is. A lot of times, you know, you'll have to make changes to it if it's something doesn't run or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's, you know, that's the challenge of open source, right? You have, you're yeah. uh, saying this needs to be improved. You make the improvement and then, you know, they, it tries, mm -hmm. we try to integrate it into the code base and that's where the fun is sometimes. It's like, <laughs> but, yeah. but eventually I think it should be accepted. Um, and then the issues here are, um, we have uh, one here by Sushmanth, which is changes are needed in the main YAML file about Python versions. That's the one you mentioned. So that'll be, you know, we can address that soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we have another one, uh, Mayuk. That was from last year. Uh, okay. Uh, did, yeah, I have updated it. That is the pull request for what I can do. Oh, okay. Good. That issue. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, that's number 71. So, actually, when you do the pull request, it might be, I don't know if you mentioned that this is okay. uh, uh, yeah, addressing number 71. Sometimes it helps to, to put as much okay. information in as you can about it. So, in the comment down here. Okay. And many people are confusing with cell membrane segmenter and embryo segmenter. Like when I was trying to at starting in summer time, I was trying to keep another pull request. Uh, we had a confusion between cell membrane segmenter and uh, embryo segmenter actually. Yesterday also Hari Krishna was confused with that. He told like he couldn't find cell membrane segmenter file at all. But actually, what are Kawakami? Like last year, student has changed it to cell membrane segmenter to do data refining. I think we need to mention that in documentation. That's another issue there. Okay. That it has been changed. Yeah, no, we need to go over the uh, um, documentation a bit more, too. That's what I was saying. That it's like, a, yeah. you know, sometimes these things change and we don't change the documentation along with it. So. <laughs> and like you know when you're doing the uh project you know you you do a lot of things there are a lot of things boxes to check and you, not everything gets synchronized and then people get busy after the project but uh that's again the fun of open source so it's uh yeah so i guess it looks good thank you for uh contributing that's great so uh so last week I actually attended uh, Dynamics Days, which is a uh, dynamical systems conference that they hold every year. Uh, and it's usually uh, sponsored by a mathematics or physics department. And, um, you know, so there are a lot of places that host Dynamics Days and they have their local flavor of it. For example, in 2012, I went to the one in, at the University of Maryland College Park and they have a strong chaos research program there and so there was a lot of there were a lot of talks on chaos which is of course the dynamical systems version of chaos which is you know systems that are sort of on the edge of chaos that are you know uh, hard to predict they're variable but you know you're trying to use the uh, language of dynamical systems to describe them so uh you know have that sort of thing and then I went to another dynamics days where they had a big a strong emphasis on network science where people were talking about networks and how things uh, were connected together and, and you can use the language of statistical physics to understand that. This year there was a, a more general theme to dynamics days and I don't have the uh, the uh, agenda up and I'll, um, maybe I'll, I'll put together a blog post on this later but um, I, I went to the meeting last week I'm still kind of processing a lot of the talks that they gave 
Uh, there were different talks on, you know, maybe more of these traditional topics like, you know, chaos and networks and things like that. Uh, but it's always a nice diversity of talks from across dynamical systems. Um, there were some interesting talks on bio, uh, biological analysis, uh, people doing things with, uh, you know, microscopy data or with uh, genomic data, molecular data, things like that. And then there were some that weren't biological at all. There were a lot of engineering talks uh, where people were applying the methods to engineering. So um, this one was uh, actually on, this was a virtual conference. So it was hosted by a mathematics department at Trinity College, which is a small college in, uh, in Connecticut. And so they had a virtual conference. They had a lot of talks. I gave a talk, it was actually the last talk of the um, session, it was this physical intelligence and development talk. And uh, it's on the YouTube channel if you're interested in uh, watching it. Uh, it's about, I think, 20 minutes long. And it, it, it goes over some of the work we've been doing in the group on physical intelligence, or on um, networks and embryo networks and things like that. So it's a, you know, it was, it was well received. It didn't really get too many questions because it was at the end of the uh, conference. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was a, it came together pretty nicely. So um, that was uh, something that, um, you know, it was a good, good session. Like I said, I'll put some stuff together on it and uh, present it, you know, as, as a blog post in the meeting. So, uh, yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about is this, uh, this nice little tutorial someone made. Um, this is an observable tutorial, if you're not familiar with it. Yeah, so Schmuck, that's what I mean. It's, uh, they have these observable tutorials for machine learning, different machine learning techniques. And, uh, you know, you can create them. And this one is actually on an artificial life platform called Lenia. And Lenny is a platform that people use. It's, it's sort of like uh, where you have this very, it's artificial, what they call artificial life. So it's it's a simulation that creates these lifelike structures. And so this is a particle Lenia. So this is a Lenia uh, simulation, you know, it's simulating this, it looks like an organism, looks like some, an organism that's changing its shape and growing, but it's using a particle physics uh, yeah, what are the forces between the particles? Uh, I don't know. We have to look at it. Uh, <laughs> so this is using this platform, Lenia. So uh, that's that's the background here. So the simulation above shows particle Lenia, uh, the system of particles that move to minimize local energy of their interaction. So I guess there's some energy function here that gets minimized between the particles. And so it's doing this... Uh, sort of movements undulating in, in a sort of a circle and there's this, this energy minimization across the different particles uh, leading to the formation of complex and diverse structures. The system can be concisely formulated as an energy function of particle positions. So these particle positions move and they get there's an energy potential between them. An automatic differentiation conveniently provided by jacks Helps, con helps to convert potential energy into explicit motion rules. So this automatic differentiation is actually something that in, this is a computational tool, in mathematics and computer algebra, automatic differentiation, also called algorithmic differentiation or auto differentiation, is a set of techniques to evaluate the derivative of a function specified by a computer program. Uh, AD exploits the fact that every computer program, no matter how complicated, executes a sequence of ele elementary arith arithmetic operations and elementary functions. By applying the chain rule repeatedly to these operations, derivatives of arbitrary order can be computed automatically. So this is something that will allow you to, uh, to create more operations than the original program. So it's a sort of generative way of creating operations. And this is, you can see this in the simulation where it's generating sort of this 
I guess, set of rules that are allowing it to move to different shapes here, the whole system of particles. Um, but what if we would like to implement, we're back on this now, but what if we would like to implement particle linear without depending on AI libra AD libraries and languages? Both the original linear, which is a platform here, this is the original linear platform. This is a continuous cellular automata uh, that they use for uh, modeling. Well, they started modeling Conway's Game of Life, where everything is smooth, continuous, and generalized. If you're familiar with the Game of Life, this is a, a form of cellular automata that has different, uh, not only different rules, but it also has these different shapes that people classify. So there are these things called glider, gliders and guns and things like that that uh, move across the, the grid. And uh, those are things that result from this game of life and these interactions on this grid. So um, this is the platform here. They have some papers from Conway to Lenia. So it's just an extension of this continuous cellular automata. And then they use these uh, automatic differentiation to uh, translate these particle positions into like a generative set of rules. Um, and so, so both the original Lenny and Game of Life are defined by explicit sets of rules that can be easily translated into code in any language, which is what we're doing here. And then in the short article, we're going to manually derive particle linear laws of motion and implement them from scratch using JavaScript. Uh, we are going to use very few language features, or we're going to use very few language features, so the code should be easy to translate to any other programming language. So here they would go, yeah. go ahead. Apparently, can it handle three dimensions? Uh, well, not that I see. So the math is basically, they work through the math in this example. And I don't know about the original Lenia, if it can handle three dimensions. As far as I know, I think it only handles two dimensions uh, in a lot of the stuff that's been... So there's a lot of stuff that's been developed using Lenia. There, there's, you know, like different implementations like sensory motor agency. And they've done these things. They've actually plugged it into uh, platforms like Minecraft, which is actually a three-dimensional uh, platform. You know, it's like a, a virtual world. So that may actually be where they've made it into a three-dimensional um, application. So this is learning in Minecraft. So this is in three dimensions. I'm not sure how it handles this space, like if it's just doing something in two dimensions or if it's uh, running, because I mean, they might just use the Minecraft environment rather than the, you know, actually building 3D objects that do this. So I'm not really sure how this all works, but I think it, it's largely a two-dimensional platform. It could be three dimensions, I guess. Uh, but in any case, there's there's some mathematical uh, formalism here. There's some, here's the code. So the code is not hard to implement for this example, the one that we're the, the original example here. <clears throat> Uh, once we finish deriving the gradients, we can proceed to the implementation. We're going to replicate the first simulation from the particle linear article. So the same parameter values are used here. And then they, they create a part, set of particle coordinates. And then uh, the init function population populates it with random starting particle positions. And then you have, so you have an initial condition. And then you independently compute velocity of each particle given the positions of other particles. Um, and then you create these auxiliary arrays, which actually allow you to compute these differences. Uh, and then you iterate all points of particles and add their contributions to the fields in each other's positions. The time complexity of this algorithm is a high relative to maybe people's computational resources. So it's only suitable for simulations of the moderate number of particles. So you can't just use infinite particles. You have to use a small, smaller, attract what they call maybe a tractable, tractable number of particles here. Um, and so this is kind of walks you through the code for all of this and calculating these repulsive forces and these peak forces and uh, yeah, and then this tutorial should help you through at least implementing it 
uh, 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 rudimentary version, and then implementing it in something like 3D would be a lot harder, but it may be able to be done. Okay, the particles are symmetric? Uh, I think so. Okay. Okay, so they don't, in, you won't get cell cell boundaries on this. Uh, no, just the interactions between the particles. So I guess the particles are finite here. They're just circles. Uh, then you have the, just the rules that govern how they move against one another. So okay, what is the what is property of the circles differentiates? Uh, it's like the radius does. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Okay, because... You know, they're not marking them except for changing radius. Yeah. Well, and you know, they're, yeah, they're they're kind of pushing together and pulling apart here, and it's kind of shifting the entire structure because they're doing this in parallel. Yeah, but uh, they're not marking the cells as differentiation types. No, they're not. They're not differentiating the cell types or anything like that. So they're all, all the same type of, of particle. But that, that brings up an interesting point. I mean, there could be regional differences in the rules. Um, so, you know, this part of a... Uh, yeah, there are also obvious waves between them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that there happens. There may be some energy between them which attracts them and repels, make them repulsive towards each other. Maybe that's the reason they are moving in different structure. Well, yeah. They are getting attracted at some time. They do, and but the point is, is that when you have a bunch of them like this that are connected, you know, you have these collective effects. So, like, if I have two particles where there's a force, they're pushing and pulling like this, and then if this happens across, like, an array of cells, you're going to get these things okay. where, you know, it may be like a cascade where it kind of moves, like, you know, across the space, where there might be, like, a buildup if they're dense enough, a buildup of forces that kind of pushes them, yeah. like a whole bunch of them in one direction. Um, I wonder if you can uh, impose a differentiation tree structure on <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting, yeah. Or, you know, another option is to, like, locally define the forces in different ways. So, like, you know, the, the front end would have, like, different forces. The back end would have different forces interaction forces and that would you know as as you yeah. move along yeah. but embryos start off pretty symmetric so how did you get those differences <laughs> i don't know <laughs> uh, that probably bring me to the next thing i was going to talk about which is that there have been two papers i think dick sent me one and i found another one on interaction forces in embryos and uh, people are trying to quantify this uh, in different ways. So that's, that's yeah, so that's actually something that I'm, I'll move to now. So this is, uh, so this idea of an interactome, uh, you know, it's something that people talk about in terms of molecular biology. They talk about how cells interact, and they'll talk about, like, different signaling molecules that can pass between cells, and there's an interaction there. And, like, people, it, if you look through the biological literature, people often use the term interactome to mean that there are things going on between cells and not necessarily forces, although forces are maybe a definition of it, but people usually mean like signaling molecules. Yeah, I, put a, I put a name in the chat. Uh, who's Richard Feldman? Richard Feldman worked for NIH and uh, he got very involved at the end of his career on interactomes having to do with RNA molecules. Okay. okay. He's, he's, I think he has a couple of papers on it. You can't find them, they're probably in my book, they are too. Okay. Might be two ends, I'm not sure at the end. It's one or two ends. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, so these are two papers here. Um, this one is uh, from Kim et al. This is from, I think, yeah, from last late last year. So this was accepted November 16th in PNAS. Uh, and this is neighbor-specific gene expression revealed from physically interacting cells during mouse embryonic development. So this is the molecular aspect of it, but it's also 
from these physically interacting cells. So they're putting a physical um, aspect to it. So the significance of this paper, uh, the physical contact between neighboring cells is known to induce transcriptional changes in the interacting partners. So that means that you have cells that are in physical contact, meaning that they share some uh, boundary or that they're in proximity enough so that they're pushing against one another or they're pulling one another. And of course, cells aren't these little uh, circles. Oftentimes they're very, you know, they have a very uh, uh, unique shape. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they're intertwined with one another. And so this is, this, this, these forces can be uh, exerted in any number of places in the membrane. So this is important to remember. Uh, of course, cells come into physical contact during development, but also in, you know, in, in maturity when they're moving around, you know, maybe there's like uh, an injury, maybe you, have, you cut yourself and the cells migrate and they move against one another or they pull apart. And these, you know, so this, this is going on all the time, this sort of signaling. But the signaling, uh, you know, it results in these transcriptional changes. So basically, there are forces being transduced into the cell, and those forces then trigger transcriptional responses. Uh, and so that means that genes are expressed as a result of these forces. Uh, okay. But accurate, oh, go ahead. Well, I question, did they get into the question of whether or not you can imitate those forces mechanically so that the cells that you're next to with your stimulator also undergo a different change? Uh, you mean the same change or a different? I think it's... Well, whatever, yeah. whatever. I mean, if you mechanically interfere, the cell doesn't... Does the cell know it's next to another cell, or can it tell, it, tell the difference if it's from a mechanical probe? Uh, I think, well, I think they can stimulate, like, uh, a generalized uh, mechanical response. So I'm not really sure. I guess it depends on the context of where the cell is, but... I think you can um, you can mimic that stimulation, so you can uh, you know introduce different forces to the uh, I think the cytoskeleton specifically, but the membrane and those forces okay. get transduced down. There's like a generalized stress response. I mean, your your wound response is an extreme example. Well, yeah, but <laughs> they're they're different. I guess there probably are different responses, uh, but you know I don't know the literature on if people have differentiated those responses in different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, but in, in this case, in this paper, though, accurate measurement of these cell-cell contact-based influences on the transcriptome is a very different, difficult experimental task. So this is kind of speaking to the question you had about, like, what is you know, we're me if we can measure these cell-cell contacts. Okay, I've can... so far what you said. Okay. So these influences are, um, you know, figuring out. It, disentangling these different influences is hard. So uh, determining such transcriptional changes will highly enhance our understanding of the developmental process. So they use this uh, scRNA-seq, which is one of these technologies where you can uh, look at measure gene expression through looking at the sequence that's produced during transcription and then measuring the amount of that transcript uh, for a certain sequence. So you can actually map it to certain parts of the genome. Um, and so they use this technology. They isolate tissues into individual cells. Uh, well, the current technology isolates it into individual cells. So when they measure uh, RNA-seq, uh, it actually does this at a cell-by-cell -cell level. So it's, it's measuring from single cells. It's hard then, and thus it's hard to measure like if you have cell-cell interactions in a culture dish, for example, it's hard to measure those in, in, in situ. You have to dissociate the cells and measure them cell by cell. And so maybe they're interacting at one time and you take them out of their uh, plate and you, you run them through this analysis. You get transcriptional changes, but they're not really, you know, they might be due to like the stress of being ripped apart. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Or you know, being and harvested. Bradley, uh, cells, of course, in a culture dish are usually adhered to culture dish. So right. these are unstressed, of course. 
Yeah. And if you take them out, they usually round up. So they're quite different. Right? Yes. Once they're, once they're suspended in water. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they, um, yeah, they're going to undergo a lot of changes when they're taken, you know, pulled up off the dish and measured. Sure. Um, and so here we combine different, uh, another technique, PIC-seq and computational algorithms that had identify cell type contact dependent transcriptional fo profiles focusing on endoderm development. So this is uh, what they're kind of focusing in this uh, part of transcription cells that, or genes that are involved in this process. Uh, so we've uh, computationally identified and experimentally validated specific gene expression patterns depending on the presence of specific neighboring cell types. Our study suggests a new approach to disentangle the role of cell-cell interactions during embryogenesis. So they're able to use, uh, so this PIC-seq is uh, RNA sequencing of physically interacting cells. So this is a new technique. I'm not really, I'm not really familiar with this, but this is uh, apparently a different way of doing this. Um, and assess them alongside similar or cell single cell transcriptomes derived from developing mouse embryos between embryonic day seven and embryonic or seven point five and embryonic day nine point five. So this is a specific period in development, and they're using this PIC-seq technique. Now I don't like I said I don't know too much about PIC-seq, but I here's a picture of what this looks like. So your uh, mouse embryo here at seven point five days. It looks like, you know, it's sort of this elongated bean. And then 8.5 days and 9.5 days is where it really differentiates into this, uh, you know, I guess you could call it a some sort of morphology that doesn't have that bean shape. So you have this these different uh, significant differentiation over these two days. And so, you know, you can take these cells and pull them out of the embryo and, and measure the transcription of them, which is what they usually do. And that, you know, that that has a lot of problems because you have uh, a lot of genes that get upregulated, say, when the cells are being dissociated. And, and so you want to be able to get them into a context where you can look at the interaction specific effects. So this is what this PIC-seq looks like. And PIC-seq is measured for a number of genes. It looks different than the single cell RNA-seq. Uh, you have these different tissue types here at the bottom uh, for these different periods of development. So you see that there's an intensity of expression. And then these color codes at the bottom are for specific days in development. So you can see that there are differences. It's kind of hard to interpret these um, graphs because they're, they make them so that they're, they fit as much data in as possible. But it's um, basically the... Uh, what they call the upregulation or downregulation of the gene, which means they compare it to a standard, and it's like a certain amount above or below that standard. And so that's where we're getting these color differences. Now this is a UMAP, which is a dimensionality reduction of these single cells. So we have these different types of cells here, neuroprogenitors, foregut, midgut. And the point of this diagram is to show that you have a lot of different a lot of differences between cell types. So this UMAP space is like the the changes in gene expression. And then these clusters uh, are where they all have the same sort of expression profile. So you can see that they, depending on the cell type they cluster together, you get, uh, you know, so different cell types express gene the genes in the sample in the same way. If you have like, uh, say for example, a hindgut versus a foregut uh, cell, they're going to express their genes in a way that's consistent with their cell type. And I don't know if they can, they don't compare this to like interacting versus non-interacting cells, but that's the way they've, they've kind of plotted that out. So um, this is another example here. Uh, so this kind of shows the PIC-seq again. It shows some of these things from these different markers. And it shows this, uh, let's see, NP and DE are these marker genes. And it's showing differences here for single cells. Um, 
using this uh, pick seek method. Um, yeah. So, and then this is neighboring cell type prediction from RNA seq. Here they have an image of the uh, embryo, and they're showing like some of these neighbor cell type predictions. So they're able to predict the different cell types that are interacting. Um, so if you look at single NP cells in the original MarsSeq data set that are predicted to interact with D or NC, predictions are based on expression to find neighbor specific genes from PicSeq. Uh, single D cells in the original MarsSeq data set, which is something they use to uh, validate this, uh, that are predicted to interact with NP. So they're actually able to look in uh, like an embryo in there, or in a embryo image and they're able to like look for these specific um, markers and they can see the interacting cells in situ instead of in this analysis where they just have like a heat map. So um, I don't know if they've defined MarsSeq in here. Uh, these papers are really difficult to kind of parse out a lot of this, but um, so visualizing spatial structure of tissue using spatial T-SNE. So now they're using the spatial version of T-SNE, which is also, it's a, a, a dimensionality reduction algorithm that's very, it's similar in some ways to the UMAP, which is up here. So this is UMAP here. And this gives you a dimensionality reduction and it gives you these clusters, but there's uh, T-SNE actually gives you spatial T-SNE gives you spatial resolution on top of that. And so um, T-SNE is a different algorithm, but it's using, um, so this is the, the t spatial T-SNE. This is showing these different uh, cell types in this. Uh, so these are the plots. This recapitulates the spatial distribution of cells in mouse embryos. And then this in this A, so these clusters are here, but they're in the spatial, they're organized spatially as they might be found in the embryo. And then B are expression patterns of these different markers, NP, DE, and NP plus DE. And this is in this uh, spatial t sneak plot. So this is clustering in space. And then the color is the amount of uh, difference in gene expression. So you can see that there are these clusters along different axes in space uh, for these things. So this is a, a pretty, uh, you know, jam-packed study. It allows us to look at some of these patterns of uh, cell contacts during morphogenesis, what cells are influencing each other's gene expression, uh, they're exploiting various signaling molecules, direct cell cell contacts, and ways that the mechanical environment gets reconfigured based on some of these interactions that are going on. So it's really, you know, this is an interesting way to, to quantify it, but it still doesn't really address the core issue of like, you know, measuring the forces between cells. It's just giving us information about like, and they're trying to do a lot of inference here. So it's not like they're getting, um, you know, a very uh, strong account of the forces and the, the effect of the forces on gene expression. It's sort uh, of like I'd inferring. Like, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to see that strain curve with the gene expression or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or stress strain curve with the gene expression yeah. somehow. Right. right. Yeah, they announced that they seem to start at a late neuroplate stage. Yeah. They don't have any data from early state, earlier stages? I don't think so. I think in this paper, they just did that stage. So they did, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of weird. It's sort of like watching a house built, but only after most of the structure is up. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't get to see how the foundation was made. Right, right. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this shows like you know they take it from an e uh, eight point five embryo, so that's a eight point five, and they're able to take the cells out. They sort them using facts by yeah. these different markers, and then they do these these sort of you know they what they have to do is take the cells out of their context, and they say okay, what are they what kind of markers can we sort them by? Uh, and then these happen to sometimes to be different cell types, but sometimes yeah. not. 
And so, you know, what would be interesting is if you had undifferentiated cells, and as they're differentiating, do these maybe yeah, similar the initial state, the, the, the whole this this approach to embryology, and you start from the almost adult now, uh, it seems to me backwards. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and they're taking it out and plating it. They're plating it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. it in that uh, the proper environment. The, the base environment is the plate. Like yeah. um, when I present the PowerPoint, it, the, I have one paper, and it goes into the elasticity of of uh, the base. Um, for development, uh, I don't have it here, but yeah, I can give you a, a, a crude analogy. Suppose you put a bunch of people on the moon without spacesuit, spacesuits, and tried to study their sociology. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. Yes, so, there would be some interactions. Yeah. <laughs> it, would, it would definitely be not, yeah. <laughs> not normal. <laughs> they died. Yeah, well, these cells are probably not in very good shape from the point of view of differentiation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that and putting them in a centrifuge again, that's sort of my pet peeve. You put it in a centrifuge. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's why I, I think it's essential to do experiments on intact embryos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, not pull them apart this way. Yeah. So the second paper is this, uh, this is from Nature Chemical Biology. This suggests that there's some sort of macroscopic quorum sensing that sustained differentiating embryonic stem cells. And so this is for stem cells, uh, you know, the murine embryonic stem cells, which are from mice and rats. Um, so they're looking at this uh, this set of cells. This is one like cell type, and they're looking at this potential quorum sensing. So quorum sensing is where you have a bunch of cells. Uh, this happens a lot in bacteria, and the cells will signal each other, and they'll come to a decision based on a quorum. So a quorum is a if you have enough individuals that make a certain decision uh, that, you know, the the collective will say, okay, this is what we're going to do. So, you know, changing direction might be an example where a bunch of cells are moving around, they don't know where to go. They all signal each other with, you know, maybe information about what's in different directions, and they all decide we're going to move left. And so that happens through a collective decision making. And so they've okay. studied this in bacteria, but not necessarily in uh, Okay, Bradley, an interesting point, right in that second sentence. In uh, the in the abstract? Yeah, in the abstract. How far apart interacting cells are. Yeah. Okay, from their point of view, a differentiation wave would be a quorum sensing signal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, because the distance since a wave can traverse many cells, it can transmit information over a number of cells, and therefore the interaction distance can be a whole big tissue. Right. right. Yeah. So and I never thought of differentiation waves from the point of view of quorum sensing, but it makes sense. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is this basically talks about cell secreting molecules, uh, and it helps in each other's replication. In cell cultures, chemical signals might diffuse only within a cell colony or yeah. between colonies. So yeah, this what I'm saying is they, they have a bias towards chemical signals, as if the chemical signals don't exist. Right, yeah, <laughs> which of course they do. <laughs> and so the, the interaction length, how far apart interacting cells are, is often assumed to be some value without rigorous justifications. But of course, it depends. Yeah, I mean, you have forces. And again, cells are, you know, in stem cells, they're, more or less circular, but in other types of cells, you have a geometry where they may intermingle or, you know, they have other mm -hmm. points of contact. So the, the physical forces are going to be different in like stem cells versus like a, some sort of cell, like a neuron or something like that. Okay, um, amusing. I have an amusing sideline on this. Uh, probably 30 years ago, stem cells were discovered in the brain. Yeah. Okay, uh, which counteracted the idea that the brain was fixed. Right. Okay. 
So what this might suggest is that due to the core of sensing, perhaps we'll grow, each of us can grow a second brain. Yeah. <laughs> so the, so what they found here with murine embryonic stem cells, uh, differentiating embryonic stem cells secrete FGF4, which is a, fa a growth factor, and other, the MG, they focus on FGF4, and then other, also other uh, molecules to communicate over many millimeters in cell culture dishes. So this is where they're not in contact physically, but they can communicate over distances of many millimeters, which is actually, you know, a pretty decent size if you think about cells being maybe the same uh, diameter, you know, uh, or less, you know, being, this is a pretty decent size for a cell culture. Um, uh, in cell culture dishes and thereby form a spatially extended macroscopic entity that grows only if its centimeter scale population density is above threshold. So over a centimeter or maybe a, a, a square centimeter or a cube so, cubic centimeter, there are a lot of cells. There are a fair number, you know, the population is going to be, you know, well, uh, fairly. Did they, give, did they give some numbers for that uh, critical cell density? Uh, it's probably in the paper here. Uh, but there, the point is there's a threshold value where they have to come into that context. Yeah. So they have to meet, you know, usually the cells will be, you know, far apart. And then they start to form, they start to get dense. And eventually in a culture dish, they get confluent, which means that yeah. the cells are packed in. The, yeah, the reason I ask is because uh, we did a study of pigment cells moving over the uh, uh, over the body of zebrafish embryos. And they move, they, the cells seem to move as a sheet, but their connections were sparse. So there was lots of space between cells also. So it, it, was, it was more like a net, like a fishnet, than, uh, uh, than a continuous sheet of cells. Yeah. And yet the fishnets looked like it moved, by, moved as, a, as a sheet. Yeah. Okay, so that's why I ask you uh, what, what value did they get for critical density because my impression is it was pretty low for that cell sheet. Right, right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this shows, this figure first of all shows these different models for autonomous and collective growth and it shows that you have, when you have sparsity, you have this, you know, you have growth of cells and they get more packed in the growth rate might be uh even or it might be like uh log uh log linear or it could be log linear in a different way and this gives you so there's some threshold population size that gets reached um and you know you can model this and, and it's not you know there are ways you can model cell growth i've done this where you sample the culture at different times for a certain cell type and you look at their division rate, you can, you know, uh, count cells using a cell counter and you take it at different points in time and you establish this curve. And then this curve you can use to predict for different cell types what the growth rate should be and what the density will be for a certain size. What, so, What's the mechanism of extinction? Uh, I guess when the, the cells don't divide or they don't. So sometimes in, in cell cultures you get this situation where if you're, especially if you have like cells that are, you're trying to recover from a source, you plate them and then they just have a few cells and then they just don't expand anymore. And sometimes that's because of the age of the cells. Sometimes that's the uh, culture growth factors and things like that. But you get like, you plate it with maybe two cells and it only gets like five or six and then those cells die. So the density of the cells if you can maintain a certain density of cells in a culture, it'll like become confluent. But sometimes okay. they don't and they die off. That might be related to the notion that if you get an infection, the, the size of the population you're infected with determines whether or not you resist it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing is, are those cells undergoing apitope? Ap ap apoptosis. Apoptosis. Well, yeah, you know, if you take like cells that are, well, stem cells are immortal. 
but sometimes they do get like you know they're like depending on the context if they're not getting enough energy from the culture medium they can yeah they can go undergo apoptosis for differentiated cells sometimes they'll uh, if you if they divide enough times they'll undergo apoptosis and they start to form these blobs and then they die they they go extinct the culture goes extinct you can't derive okay, that, cells. that doesn't seem to be the situation here because no. if you have only two cells they should have lots of medium <laughs> yeah yeah well what happens i think in the stem cells is they don't get the sig like they don't get enough signal so if you have a low number of cells that you plate you know they don't okay yeah. Okay. That, I guess that's the question. Do they go into apoptosis? Ap <laughs> how do you apoptosis. Uh, yeah. Apoptosis uh, as a function of cell concentration. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, they may, and, and you know, if they're not, but usually they just die, and that's that. But it, yeah, it, well, just yeah. die is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Given lots of medium, just die may mean an active process of apoptosis. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So this is again, this plating where you get the uh, embryonic stem cell and, and it's, they start to differentiate at these different factors to differentiate the cells or different chemicals that they introduce. So they can actually achieve differentiation in sparsely seeded cells and then they can grow to larger sizes. They don't, don't need chemicals. They just need the right elasticity of the medium. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> you mean the interaction with the cell, with the culture dish? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interaction with culture dish. That's true. Yeah. You can achieve it through if, that too. If you put glass down here, you'll get bone. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Different different surfaces result in different types of cells. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, I've got it on my PowerPoint. I'll I'll polish it up and and just present a cell um, um, PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, um, Bradley, what is culture dish? I mean, can oh, I know? I don't know. But what so, does culture dish mean? Yeah. So what they do is they'll have these like uh, they're like either glass or they're some sort of polystyrene plate, and they usually look like a little circle. Then they have a cover, and you'll put like you'll put cells in there. You'll take like a, a liquid medium with you know chemicals, nutrients, and you'll what they call suspend cells. So you can put cells as a mass in there, okay. and then you'll put it on the plate, and it spreads out. And then they'll they'll attach themselves to the bottom, and they'll start to expand. But they'll yeah. start to divide, and you sometimes, can look under a microscope and see them. Sometimes the plate is first covered with a for example, a protein. You give the cell something to adhere to other than the glass or plastic. Yeah. yeah. And I've been reading literature that says that if it's elastic, you'll get um, mesenchyme or medium tissue, um, which is uh, fat cells and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, an extreme of that. So <laughs> Have you looked at Ingber's papers on pattern surfaces? Yeah, and pattern surfaces do different things. Yeah. Measure how the cells interact with with a pattern surface to see what forces they yes, do because they'll yeah. bend yeah, I agree. the, the uh, posts. Yeah, or uh, I think he used a, a checkerboard made of hydrophobic and hydrophobic squares. Oh, okay. And he found that... Uh, what the how the cells acted? I don't remember the details. How the cells acted depended on the size of the squares. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and but if you just leave cells on a glass plate, you're likely to get bone. Right. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so I think this is the part that Nick was asking about here. They had, uh, so they had different cell densities. They had, uh, they would take, like, they'd start the cell cultures. They'd uh, randomly scatter the cells uh, on the plate. And then the resulting population density ranged from around 5 cells per centimeter squared to around 15,000 cells per centimeter squared. So they had a very large range of 
densities starting off with densities. Uh, and then every dish had sparsely distributed near isolated cells. With a wide field microscope, we observed that the cells cover less than 1% of every dish. So this is the initial condition. Uh, and then the average distance between two nearest neighboring colonies, which are groups of cells that sort of cluster together. It's usually if they're starting to divide, they form these colonies. Uh, but they're separate a lot of times in, in the dish when you start at this density. Decreased as this heated population density increased. So the distance between the colonies in decreased as the colonies expanded and came closer to one another. But was always around 100 microns or more. So 100 microns is a micrometer. So that's uh, smaller than a centimeter. Uh, and you, you're getting like at these, that that's sort of the this length scale that we're talking about. Um, so this is where we start. And then this collective growth of threshold density, uh, we get uh, populations that begin with a sufficiently high density above one, uh, 1,700 cells per centimeter square grew towards what they called the carrying capacity, which you saw up in one of these, this graph here at the top. So the carrying capacity was sort of like the, the, uh, the maximum uh size or the maximum density i believe um and uh whereas the populations that began with a sufficiently low density below 1700 cells per centimeter approached extinction over six days so what would happen would be you'd have cells if they're dense enough if they're over 1700 cells per centimeter squared they'd grow towards this confluent state where they covered the dish. And this is the carrying capacity, which is the top density that's possible in the dish. If they started below 1,700 cells per square centimeter, then they would go towards this extinction where they just couldn't signal and they would die off and that's, it would crash. Okay. Bradley, not quite. Some, some, tissue, some cells in tissue culture will make two layers of cells. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they made it, they, they uh, made the, uh, well, I don't know how they were measuring the number, but oh, oh, they reach what it's called a confluent layer of cells if, if the cells stay monolayer. Right, they right. Fill a dish right. and stop growing. Yeah. Okay. There's there's a lot of work on that. Okay. Okay. If I uh, that zebrafish paper was rejected about forty years ago, if I can find the manuscript, but <laughs> I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'd love to see it too. Oh, okay. Sure. Right. And so to, to finish up here, this is there's communication at the millimeter scale. This results in this ability for collective growth. So they propose that there's this uh, intra-colony communication and local colony to colony communication. So there are two different levels of communication. We need to uh, sort of, you know, in fact, we can kind of measure these interaction length scales and that gives us some indication of what the cells are doing in terms of how these signals oh. are, are affecting them, so I see they did time lapse. Did they see waves or not? Uh, time lapse. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> you just passed by time. Uh, further explore. Yeah, it's in that paragraph in that section. Communication at millimeter scale. Okay. Uh, so to further explore intracolony communication. We examine our stochastic model by varying both the threshold concentration and colony radius. Uh, then the colony's growth is uncorrelated with its initial area when it is too small. Uh, we confirm this measurement by measurement areas of differentiating E14 cell colonies of four okay. days of multiple. I might have missed it. Maybe it wasn't that. Oh, okay. it, was, it was searching the document for the word time. Time. Okay, uh, let's see. I wonder if I can search using this. Um, oh, yeah. Um, ah, there you go. Okay, the again. Time. I'm not sure how they spell time lapse. It may or may not have a dash after time. Okay, time. Well, let's see. I think it's always that. Very well, Microsoft. The microscope time lapse movies also reveal that a colony's growth rate was independent of the number of colonies. That's what we did there. Uh, 
For example, in the low density population, virtually every colony died in the field of view within 10 colonies, whereas in the high density population, virtually every colony survived. Uh, okay, so I'm see. asking if they'll send you their movies, maybe we could figure out whether or not they saw waves. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll see. I'll see about that. Sometimes they make the data available. Yeah. And yeah. So you like to further and analyze their movies. Okay. Oh, this is the, yeah. This is the one. The uh, chemical biology paper. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a note of that. All right. So that's all. All we had with that paper. And that was a great. Conversation. <laughs> so yeah, I'm done. Uh, do we have any other things we want to talk about? Yeah, it looks okay. like Ira, Ira had to leave. Susan, you have to close those blinds behind you if you want us to see your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll do that for next time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Bradley. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Can you share me any like resources for graph neural networks? Uh, actually, I've been working on mostly on CNN and RNN and neural networks. Can you? I have seen the uh, Twitter link. It's pretty good enough. But do you find any research paper regarding it? If 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 you share, if you have anything, I would it would be a great help. Yeah. Yeah. I'll uh, share some things. Having, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Mainly, mainly about graph neural networks. These many days, I was continuously working on CNN actually, and GANs. So uh, GN was like completely new to me. I just want to get uh, around touch with it. Can you share me any resources like video tutorials or something like that? I have been going through your last year uh, GSOC uh, time period meetings also to understand about it, but they are pretty. Um, Hard to understand. So, if any resources you have, could you just say it to me? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. I'm. I tend to rely on Coursera and Udemy and edX and try to find uh, a course that discusses these these sorts of things that I need. I yeah. I recently took a course on uh, cell biology, which was about how actin and microtubules work. And it was on, I think it was on edX. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'll make those available on the Slack. Um, okay. And we okay. did some last year, but I, I have to go find them. <laughs> because we had, okay. we had some, yeah. It's always a hard, steep learning curve, uh, I will say, okay. to learn about graph neural networks. So. I, I need to do neural nets, and I was trying to learn deep, Deep learning last year and it blew up because I was supposed to do other things. Yeah. 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 It was ordered to do other things. Yes. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, have a good week. Okay. Uh, and talk to you next week. And if you, you know, we can stay in touch via email and Slack. So. Okay. Well, if I, I get my PowerPoint together, I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Please do. Look forward to Okay. It. Okay. Okay. Bradley, nose yeah. to the grindstone. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. bye.